people jumping in, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, if you are not familiar with me, my name is Dr. Tanya Harrison, and I call myself a professional Martian because I've spent the last 15 years or so working in science and mission operations for different NASA Mars missions, um, from rovers to satellites. And so this type of presentation doing for me for Medium Day is kind of a new venture for me. Usually I'm talking to people about science um, or about how to get into STEM careers. And I thought that this might provide an opportunity to reach maybe a less sciencey audience and talk more about how I've approached sharing my story working in Mars and how maybe there are lessons you could learn from that to apply to your writing on Medium. Um, so my Medium posts have tended to focus on things related to Mars or space exploration in general. And I've had a few different articles featured by Medium, and these have tended to be stories that focused on my personal experience working in space. I've written some listicle type articles like, you know, top 10 discoveries by the Perseverance rover or top nine things that Curiosities found on Mars for the ninth land anniversary of the rover. And they tend to get good readership, but not necessarily uh, the most engagement from the readers, like asking questions or saying that they can really relate to something in the story. The stories that have really resonated with the medium editors tend to be ones, um, the two that come to mind in, in particular are one talking about the night we said goodbye to the Opportunity Rover, which was an incredibly personal account of the last night of the Opportunity Rover mission where uh, the longest live rover that we'd ever had on Mars, it was supposed to last for 90 days, lasted for 15 years. Um, unfortunately, we lost the rover to the most uh, the strongest dust storm we had ever seen on Mars, which I think there's no more fitting way that we could have lost a mission like Opportunity. Um, but the the conclusion of that mission was an extremely emotional moment for all of us who had spent many years of our lives. And in some cases, some people had spent their entire careers working on this mission. And so I really wanted to highlight the human side of what that was like for a mission to actually come to a close beyond just losing contract, losing contact with a rover. Um, the other story that was featured by Medium Editors was talking about how I had spent most of my career on Mars and then a few years ago made kind of a shift in my day job to working for an earth observing satellite company that was focused on looking at the earth every day. And that ended up giving me a really unexpected perspective, at least unexpected to me, looking at the earth versus Mars as planets and gaining a better appreciation for our home planet and really wanting to share that story of spending literally 15 years every single day of your life working on another planet and then coming home, so to speak, and, and seeing your home in a different way. And I realized from this and a few other experiences that sharing that personal side of your story is really how you can resonate with people, especially if you're writing in an area where the kinds of stuff you might normally be talking about are factual things. And in the world of AI, writing about just facts is not really going to be a great way to be sustainable anymore because somebody could just go to something like chat GPT and get a list of facts or facts, maybe not actually facts. Um, or you just search on the internet and try to find these things. But people generally want to know what is your perspective? What is your opinion? What do you think as an expert in whatever field you might be an expert in or whatever field you might be focusing on for your writing, you know, what should these people care about and make them come back to you for what you're looking for? Um, another experience I had in this area was a few years ago, I was asked to give a keynote presentation for a conference where I was the first woman opening keynote that they had ever had. And this conference had been going on for at least a couple of decades. I forget what uh, year it was for the conference. And I had planned to just come in and give a talk I'd given before about weather on Mars because uh, it tends to be a crowd pleaser. Not many people know that Mars is a very active planet when it comes to weather. And so I thought for this conference, which is focused on students, it would definitely be a new audience for this type of topic. As I was preparing for this, I was sitting at a hotel bar across the street from the conference venue at a university, and I happened to run into a friend that I hadn't seen in a few years. And I told him that I was the keynote speaker. He asked what talk I was giving, and I told him, and he was like, Tanya, no, you can't do that. Like, you are being given a platform for these students. They don't, they don't need to hear the facts about Mars. They need to hear about you. 
They need to hear about your career path, how you got to where you are so that they can see themselves in your footsteps. Like you need to tell your story. And that felt so uncomfortable for me at the time. And it wasn't that I hadn't shared that story before. I'd been quite open on social media with my career path into the space industry and how I'd done all the things I'd gotten to do in my career. But it always felt a little strange to frame it in terms of myself. I kind of liked being a vessel for the information about Mars and have people focus on that part. Like I was just the one delivering it. And so having somebody give permission or tell me, no, people actually want to hear about you as a person and what you are bringing to this was something that I had to sit with for a minute and become comfortable with. And I I thought about it and I said, you're right. I, I need to change this. So in the span of I think maybe less than an hour, I made an entirely new slide deck for this presentation, went across the street and told told folks, I said, you know, this talk is not going to be the one that you see in your program um, because I just had this interaction across the street and I think this person was right. So instead, I'm going to give you this completely, completely different talk. And uh, it, it was a very emotional presentation. I cried in the middle of it, which I had never done in a talk before. Um, it was very raw because uh, my career has not been uh, without hardship to get to where I, I am in my career today. And this was in 2018 or 2019. And I still have students that come up to me at conferences today or send me messages on LinkedIn or send me emails through my website who have maybe never reached out before, but said, I came to your talk at this conference called Space Vision and it resonated with me so much or like I still remember that talk today and that means so much to me and it was just this really eye-opening moment of okay yes you need to share your personal story and I think that that's where it starts to get scary because you're making yourself a little bit vulnerable by putting yourself out there it's easy to be the one that's just delivering facts but as soon as you're giving you know your story and your opinion on things it gives an opening for people to, you know, attack you for that. Um, this was something I had to learn a lot in uh, the news interview space as well. I do a lot of sort of talking head bits for space on things like Al Jazeera and BBC and um, the Aus ABC in Australia for some reason, even though I'm not Australian. <laughs> I appreciate that they call, but it seems like an odd choice. Um, and at first I used to cram for those because they tend to not give you very much advance notice. They'll send you an email and say, hey, we need to interview somebody in a few hours about this new thing that's dropped today, something about the Hubble Space Telescope or the first all-female spacewalk or something like that. Um, and I used to cram, like I was studying for an exam. I'd remember all sorts of facts, like how fast is the spaceship flying? How far away is it? Like what are, what are the, the things that people might ask you on a quiz? And then I realized doing enough of these interviews the news reporters themselves, kind of the person doing the the in-depth reporting before they would switch to you as a talking head, they're the ones giving all that factual information. They've already looked all of that up because it's easy to find on the internet. What they're asking you as the talking head is, what is your opinion on this? How does this matter in the grand scheme of things? Can you translate the kind of big picture of this into a perspective that will resonate with the general public and get them to care about it? And again, you're, you're giving your opinion, in this case, in front of an audience of thousands to maybe even millions of people, and that can be very daunting. And it's the same sort of thing when you're writing on Medium. You have so much information and so many voices on here. The key is going to be, how can you put yourself into your writing and share your story in whatever you're trying to convey so that people have a reason to resonate with you as an author so that they're not just necessarily reading your single article that they've come across for the information that's in that article and they've moved on about their day to whatever else they might want to look at. What can they get from that where they want to bond with you as a person and they're they're wanting to come back and read more specifically from you? Um, and so it's it's something where it's hard maybe to give yourself the permission to put yourself in your writing like that if it's not something you're already comfortable with. Um, Maybe it's something you're a little more comfortable with if you're used to writing like fiction, for example, where you're really pouring a lot of your imagination into something in a way that you wouldn't do if you're writing 
science communication type material. Um, or maybe if you're somebody that's working on a memoir, obviously you're doing something that is incredibly personal. Um, and so you've already given yourself permission to do, that, to do that. So I realize the perspective I'm giving here is very much biased toward somebody coming in from a science communication type lens. But I think giving yourself that permission to open up uh, and be personal is, is something that is extremely valuable for getting your writing out there and having people connect with you as a person. Um, there's an icon that came up here. Um, let's see, I see Hashem, you showed up in the moderation. Were you wanting to ask a question on camera? If you wanna put your answer in the chat. Okay, I don't see anything coming through yet, so I'll turn that off for now. Um, let's see. Sorry, still figuring out the notifications that are coming up on the interface here. Okay. Um, so I wanted to try to, yeah. Oh, okay. This comment from Sammy is really good. It's like an X-Men ability to distill complex information and clearly communicate it. So everyone instantly gets it. That's so true, especially in science. And I think it's something where, if you're good at it, you almost take it for granted because it it feels like if you're taking something that is full of a lot of jargon and distilling it down into simple language, that shouldn't be that complicated. But scientists are really, really bad at it, which I've learned over the last you know 15 plus years of working with a lot of scientists. And you know that's not meant to insult people that I've worked with. I've just learned that it's more of a skill than maybe people realize. When you spend every day thinking in this type of terminology that you're using every day with the people around you, it is easy to forget sometimes that maybe some words here and there are not things that are just in common parlance. Um, but there's always a more direct way to get something across. Uh, and I don't like the idea of saying like dumbing down something. I just think that uh, certainly when it comes to science, we have a lot of overly specific terminology that maybe has its place when you're writing a scientific article where it is very important for you to distinguish, you know, what are we calling the size of the grains in this rock? Because it matters based on how this rock formed or the environment that it's from. But if you're talking to just a person, like they probably don't care if the grain size in the rock is, you know, sand versus silt versus clay. Like that isn't something that you necessarily need to get into. So um, this is where I actually found before Twitter turned into a dumpster fire. Uh, I found Twitter to be really useful in helping to distill complex information down into more easy to understand terms because the old 140 character limit for tweets really meant that you had to tighten up what your message was to try to get that information across. Um, another job I had in the past uh, while I was in grad school was that I was an editor for blog articles for a group called the Planetary Society, where we would have a lot of guest authors come in who were um, professors at different universities or practicing scientists with NASA. And they would write articles about things like the dynamics of particles in Saturn's rings or um, things that certain missions had been up to in the solar system. And they're always very good articles. We made sure that we were working with really great people. But part of my job was to remove the academies, as my boss put it, because they weren't always uh, easy to read for a lay person. And so that forced me to think with every single article that I read, are the words that are being used by this person the words that really need to be used to, to convey this point? And some articles were very, very hard, even as somebody who at that point, I was two or three years into a PhD, some of those articles were hard for even me to understand with the level of jargon that were written in them. But it was a very useful exercise to sit down and think and say, okay, like, how can I translate this into something that is understandable for other people? Um, so again, very, very SciComm sci specific there, but if you are in a field where maybe that applies to you, maybe if you're writing in um, technology communications or medical communications, I would say that is an area where I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, it, it's the similar kind of thing. There's a lot of jargon that is used that is not 
necessarily needed to get the point across that you're trying to make. And so I do wish like scientists and medical professionals would kind of come together and be a little bit better about communicating with people because no matter what format you're doing this from, whether it's a blog on Medium or some other social media outlet or just communicating with somebody like in the medical office or trying to have a conversation with somebody about climate change, for example, being able to communicate with them like at their level of understanding and relate to them in a way that they will want to listen to you and have a dialogue rather than feeling shut down because they feel like they're too dumb to talk to you. I hate that attitude. I've had people say that to me like, oh, I don't feel like I'm smart enough to talk to you because you're a scientist. And I never want anybody to feel that way. Like I want people to feel safe, to be curious and be and want to ask questions. And some people have been burned before because they'll say, you know, they asked a, a scientist a question on social media and they, they got a really rude response or the person just kind of was dismissive or maybe they thought that they were being a troll because they weren't sure that they were asking a genuine question when it was really just coming from a place of this is a simple question that I've always wanted to ask. And I didn't have the opportunity to ask an expert until I had access to a platform like Medium where you can write an article and people can comment in the replies and you can start having a dialogue. And I think that that dialogue is so important and it's often missing when it comes to science and, and medicine. Um, I'm taking a look at some of the comments to see if we had some questions come through. I'm seeing one uh, from somebody saying, being personal has never been easy for me because my brain works so hard at language, technology and doing both things at the same time is very hard for me. I can understand that it is kind of like using two different parts of your brain, right? When you're talking about like the science or the technology, the thing that you might be writing about. And maybe if you're writing about something that feels very sterile, you might think there's not any, any way to inject myself into this thing that I'm writing. And this is where I would say um, the exercise that I wanted to give to you all today uh, when I thought this was maybe more of like a, a Zoom type interface where I might be able to see all of you, <laughs> was that I wanted you to all think about maybe either a recent article that you've posted on Medium, where if you haven't injected some of your personal story into it or your personality in, in general in a way where you feel like your readers might really resonate with you, um, kind of go back and take a look at that and see are there any gaps in there where you could tie in some personal story that make people relate to you while you're telling the, the story or making the point that you're trying to make in the article? If you don't have a, a Medium article that exists yet, maybe you're just getting started or you don't, you've never really thought about trying to tie in the personal side before. Um, the other thought for the exercise was think about maybe a recent news event or some very notable news event, maybe not recent, where you might have an interesting perspective on it because of maybe where you were or some personal connection you had to the event um, or some opinion that you have on the event based on your personal or professional experience? Um, is there like a story about it that you might have wanted to share with somebody that you haven't had the chance to share and maybe Medium is a great uh, format for you to do that in? Um, think about those examples and see if there, there is a way for you to make those connections. Um, somebody in the comments saying, a big problem for me coming from a background in social sciences in sociocultural anthropology, which is the ivory tower manifested. Yeah, that is such a huge problem in academia and it literally drives me crazy. Um, I, I hate the elitism that is built into academia and the idea that we can't use layperson terminology for anything because it is dumbing it down or it's beneath us somehow to use that language. I've worked with people like that repeatedly throughout my career and I want to punch them in the face. <laughs> It's so counterproductive. I mean, we're doing science. A lot of this science tends to be funded by taxpayer dollars. And so I feel like it, it, we are responsible for communicating what we are doing with that money and why it matters to them and why their taxpayer money is going toward funding that in the first place. Um, so the exercise part of this was meant to take up the last 10 or 15 minutes. So uh, I apologize that 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 part, I don't think there's a great way to do it in this interface, but if anybody has stories that they want to share in the chat that I can read out loud, or if anybody has any questions, um, please put them in the chat and, and I will read them out loud and answer them. And thank you for the folks that have put kind words in the chat so far. I really appreciate it. Like I said, this is a very new format and topic for me to be discussing. So it's uh, 
this is an experiment for sure. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Someone asked if I'm in Toronto. Uh, I'm actually from Seattle. Well, I'm in Seattle right now. Um, I kind of go back and forth between Seattle and Toronto. So this is my my homage to my other home. Um, also says, yes, you do like Mars. Yes. This is, this is literally my entire shelf of Mars books. This is other space books that are not necessarily Mars. This is all kids books. Most of them are books that I've consulted on, which is always really fun. Um, see, someone said, have you had a situation where you felt you got too personal and what boundaries have you discovered? That's a really good question. Um, I'm the kind of person that in general, I feel like I don't have any boundaries when it comes to being willing to answer the type of questions that people will ask. I haven't really had anybody venture into a realm that felt too inappropriate. I would say, um, the closest I felt maybe was not necessarily in a writing context, but I did a fireside chat earlier this year with the CEO of a very large aerospace company who wanted to do a chat about um, LGBTQ rights and protections in the workplace. And I had never been asked to speak about something like that before. Um, and I, I felt a little awkward because I, I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm the right person to be a mouthpiece for the community in that way because uh, I, I didn't feel like I had a lot of um, direct experiences in my career that were necessarily related to being queer. And so I thought, you know, maybe somebody that was, you know, more outwardly like, uh, like someone that was trans or maybe somebody that had been like out and gay for their whole career would be a better representative for talking about these questions. And Kind of similar to the the speech for the student conference, I was talking about this with a friend of mine who's in the same field as I am, saying, "I don't know if I feel like I'm the right person to have this conversation." And he was he said very similarly, like, "No, this is about your story. Like, people want to hear your story, um, and so they're not expecting you to be speaking on behalf of the whole community. They're expecting to talk based on your experience." And I don't know why people keep having to tell me that <laughs> before I release things in. It says, okay, it's okay to tell your story and not say that you're speaking on behalf of everybody. Um, you're just giving your opinion and your experience. Uh, it's It's been very valuable, but certainly there have been steps in being comfortable with that. Um, like in my very early days on social media, before I even started on Medium, I was mostly posting on Twitter and it was all just facts. I very rarely spoke about myself or like anything personal. Um, so it, it took many years to really get to a level of comfort where now it's like, everything is game. I'll answer pretty much any question about anything because I want people to feel again, like very comfortable to approach me like as a scientist and as a person to ask these questions. Um, someone else asking, what are your thoughts on Goodnight Oppie, especially in terms of the emotional storytelling versus perhaps the reality of it? Um, I thought Goodnight Oppie was really well done. Uh, I saw it in a movie theater screening for aerospace professionals and I literally broke down in tears. Um, if you haven't seen it, this is a documentary that's available on Amazon Prime and it goes through the story of the Spirit and Opportunity rover mission, collectively called the Mars Exploration Rover's mission. Um, but it really focuses a lot on the human side of working on these missions by focusing on a few key folks in operations throughout the course of the 15 years that the rovers were functional. Um, there, there's certainly some stuff that's like mildly exaggerated for dramatic effect, but not anything to the level of it being false. Um, I think overall they did an excellent job. Um, I'm in the documentary near the very end in that like saying goodbye part where I'm hugging a friend. You can only see my back, but I'm hugging a friend crying. We didn't even realize there was a camera there. And so when somebody showed us the footage from that later, uh, we were we were like, wow, we must have been so wrapped up in our own emotional world of what was happening. Like we didn't even realize there was a film crew hanging around. Um, so if you haven't seen it, um, I think it's really beautiful. And if you have any interest in Mars, uh, it's I would say it's definitely worth watching. Um, someone else says, I see you only sometimes write. Oh, sorry, it popped out. I see you only sometimes write in Medium. Uh, do you publish anywhere else? How do you approach publishing on Medium? Um, yeah, I've been a little bit slow to publish anything recently, and I feel really bad about that. I'm trying to get myself to get back into a habit of publishing more regularly. I tend to 
historically I've just been posting whenever I get inspired about something, like if there's a news story that's relevant, like a, a land anniversary, a landing anniversary, um, or I read some article or something happens that gets me like very emotionally riled up and I want to like quickly get down my thoughts about the thing that has happened. Um, I'm not so great at consistently producing, like when every time I've tried to say I'm going to write one thing a week, uh, it just doesn't work. I, my creative brain doesn't work that way, which is why I'm a scientist and not a professional science writer. I just don't think I could do it. Um, so I think maybe that's something in terms of how to approach publishing on Medium. Like I've tried to do the regular publishing thing and it just hasn't worked. But I think that it would be different if you were really trying to um, use Medium as an income source or really using it as a way to drive traffic toward your website or your newsletter or whatever it might be. Um, you might you might try more than I do at posting regularly. Um, but this is certainly motivation for me to write something and, and do it less than like once every three or four months. Um, let's see, what do you read on Medium? Um, that's a good question. I feel like I read a lot of different things. I don't read much about space, honestly. Um, I, I, I feel like I use Medium as kind of an escape into other things because I spend so much time in my day job reading books about space or reading journal articles about space that uh, I kind of like to explore other things. Um, I've been reading a lot of finance stuff in the last couple of years because coming from academia, I was extremely uh, not knowledgeable about any of that stuff because uh, counter to what people seem to think in the general public, academics are generally not paid very well. We don't have enough money to be like investing in things. So I had no idea how the stock market worked. I didn't know how investments worked. Like I'm ashamed to admit that at my age. Um, but like it's just literally been basically since during the pandemic that I was really trying to learn more about finance. And um, I found Medium useful in that regard. Also a lot of stuff around productivity. Um, again, maybe trying to force my brain into being less scatterbrained. I don't know if it's necessarily worked, but I do like reading people's tips on that nonetheless, and maybe one or two of them someday will, will spark. Um, let's see. Someone says, do you feel like there's any contradiction or tension in science writing, like between object objectivity and personal slash subjective storytelling? That's a good question too. Um, I don't know if I would, well, hmm. I feel like this, what I want to say is like a complicated answer that is hard for me to distill into two more minutes. I think that there might be contradiction sometimes, but I think that that would probably come between what I often see, like if, if, you know, my friends and I, they're like working in the space sector, read an article that's written by a journalist, especially if it's not somebody that's like a specialized space journalist, because there are a few folks that, you know, we in the community know really well, because they are like space experts, that's all they write on. But then you move into the realm of more like, speculative opinion journalists writing about space stuff, and they tend to sensationalize a lot of things or just flat out get things wrong or manipulate information to try to kind of present a narrative that doesn't necessarily really jive with what's happening in the space sector, either blatantly or behind the scenes. Um, and so I see a lot of tension come up from there, but a lot of people that are kind of working in the industry, they're either maybe in positions where they can't be so open because they might have security clearances or their employers won't be okay with it. Um, I feel like I've been in a very lucky position in that I've either had jobs where uh, they didn't mind if I was so open about these things, or we had a lot of discussions about, you know, Tanya of Mars being kind of my myself, my own persona, literally just me, versus like Tanya of whatever entity I was working for. It was very clear that those were two separate things, and they were still okay with me telling my story. Um, so I think that that kind of thing maybe hopefully that answered your question. That was, that was very rambly on my part. Um, let's see. Okay, I see someone in the chat posted their personal story. I don't, I don't know if people can see the chat. If they can't, um, it's by Mariam Saeed Khan. And the name of the story is The Mighty T Tree Dupka Tukra. I'm sorry if I'm betraying the pronunciation on that. Um, I'm copying that right now so I can read your story after this is over. 
Um, oh, and Carolyn too, thank you so much for sharing your link. I will also open that when this is done. Okay. Um, well, I guess we've run out of time. Uh, that was perfect. I'm sorry that we didn't really get to do the exercise portion of this, but thank you for those of you that shared your links. It's kind of like the exercise portion. Um, if you have any questions or want to reach out, you can find me on pretty much any social media platform as at Tanya of Mars. I'll put it in the chat. It's my name is not necessarily spelled the common Tanya way. Um, but yeah, definitely feel free to reach out. If you want to share your links to your personal stories with me, for me to take a look at your meeting, happy to take a look. Um, and thank you so much for dialing in. It means a lot for you to uh, come to this thing, maybe really late in your time zone um, and working on this experiment with me in a type of presentation I've never given before. So thanks so much, everybody.